Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on how small business can survive the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Alan Rosenberg, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County. I'll be your host. Our presenter today is Cliff Enico. More on Cliff in a minute. First, some brief information on SCORE. With 310 offices and over 10,000 volunteers nationally, SCORE started in the mid 60s as part of the SBA. At Fairfield County, we have over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value added services to small business owners. One-on-one -on -one counseling, face-to-face, -face, telephone, email, and Zoom, educational workshops and webinars as the one we're conducting today, and extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject experts at your disposal. Our next webinar is 12 noon on Tuesday, April 21st, when Nanelli Gulzaran will present five ways to get going with Google. Look for Pacifics on our fairfieldcounty.score.org website. And for free individual counseling, go to the SCORE website and click Request a Mentor. Some useful information about today's event. We have set aside time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located as part of your screen. A webinar will end at 1 p.m. to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next couple of days. Now on our speaker. Cliff Enico is a nationally recognized small business legal and tax expert, best known as the former host of Money Hunt, where entrepreneurs defended their business plans before America's toughest panel of experts. An attorney and small business consultant based in Fairfield County, Cliff has helped launch over 15,000 businesses. Cliff is the author of 16 books, most recently, Crowdfunding Handbook, How to Raise Capital for Your Business Using Equity Funding Portals. And now I'll turn it over to Cliff. Um, Thanks, Alan, for the wonderful introduction, and welcome to today's program on a very somber topic. But before we get started, just a little, a little bit of your humor, if people don't. I know everybody's social distancing these days, and I just wanted to make the comments, which should be obvious to everyone, that lawyers have a much, a much easier time uh, with social distancing than most normal people uh, because, um, because quite frankly, in, even in normal times, people don't want to be within six miles of us, uh, much less six feet of separation. Um, but, and I guarantee that is probably the only coronavirus related lawyer joke that you will hear anywhere in the world. Um, but this, today's topic is a particularly somber one. Uh, before we begin, uh, I just want to make these disclaimers uh, that we do in all of our SCORE webinars. The most important 
one is the first one. Uh, while you know, we will be getting into some legal and tax stuff on this presentation, there is a very big dif uh, difference between giving out legal information and giving out legal advice. Uh, you know, it, it's a very different thing to say, here's what the law is generally all about, uh, and saying, well, here's what you should do, Bill, and here's why, Jane, you should do something different. That's advice which can only really be given a lawyer or tax expert uh, licensed to practice in your jurisdiction uh, that is working you know, with you specifically in your situa specific situation. Um, I'm much more familiar with it than I would ever be. Okay, the virus pandemic has done something, uh, and this is in all seriousness, that I never would have thought possible. It has made me much more sympathetic than I ever have been to politicians in general, and politicians of all stripes, federal, state, local, Republican, Democrat, I don't care. Uh, these people are faced with some truly, truly horrible choice now. Um, this is an absolutely unprecedented event, at least unprecedented within our lifetime. Um, speaking as a baby boomer, um, this, these are, this is the most, the most horrible thing that has happened in this country really since World War II, which was certainly before my lifetime. Uh, I remember when I was a boy, my grandmother told me stories about, um, the, uh, blue pandemic of 1918. Uh, one of her brothers, my great uncle, uh, died in an epidemic in a very tragic way. He had been fighting over in World War I in the trenches uh, and caught the virus on a troop ship coming back to the United States and died about six to eight weeks after he landed in New York. I mean, what a horrible thing to have survived a world war and then being killed by a virus, uh, a microscopic virus. Um, but the, the, the tragedy of all this is that it puts government in the awkward position of choosing between two horrible scenarios. Scenario number one is about a quarter of a million projected deaths, uh, if you, if, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci's uh, estimate. Uh, the other, uh, other horrible scenario is a possible major recession or depression with 12 to 15% unemployment. Uh, choosing between these two things is what uh, the, the current issue of The Economist calls a grim calculus. And there is no happy solution here. There is no way to, 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 to sort of find a compromise between these two things. Um, the more we focus on restoring the economy, the more deaths and illnesses there are likely to be. The more we focus on saving human life, the worse the economic consequences of the pandemic will be. Uh, I do not mention being in the position of having to do it, to make those choices. Here are a couple of predictions for me just based upon what I am reading and seeing in the media every day, not scientific at all. Uh, one of my predictions is that for each human being who dies of the COVID-19 virus or its implications in the US, approximately 10 to 25 small businesses will go out of business permanently. Uh, there is no question, small business will be hit very, very hard here. Uh, um, and, and frankly, for and, and the main reason, poor planning. Uh, the same reason the pandemic caught everybody with their pants down from the highest levels of government uh, to the smallest of small businesses. People were just not prepared for a major disruption of their lives like this. They weren't. Uh, we, and we in this country are much better at focusing on what's right in front of us than planning for the future. And here's a, a classic example of this. Uh, but here's my second prediction. The pandemic will accelerate our progress toward a purely economy and a purely virtual world. This has been happening now for the last 10 years is getting more digital and business is getting more digital. There's no secret about that, but the pandemic is going to accelerate that process. Many companies, both small and large, are going to use this as an opportunity to reduce or cut back on their brick and mortar operations permanently. And frankly, more individuals will discover the joys of working remotely, um, which and, and I should say really welcome, welcome to the club here. Uh, all of you who are working from home for the first time, this is the way that I have been working in my law practice for the last 24 years. Uh, next year, I will be celebrating my 25th anniversary as a home-based lawyer working out of my spare bedroom. Uh, and, and I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, most people are, are coming to join that club. Uh, you have better work-life balance, and believe it or not, you're often more productive than going into an office and having to put up with endless meetings all day. I think a lot of people are going to get hooked on this, and it is going to change our world in some very profound way.
How long is this going to last? Well, my crystal ball is no better than anybody else's. Uh, the Connecticut governor, Ned Lamont, estimated it will last three to nine months. And of course, when even when it does end, it will take longer for the economy to get back on track. The most likely scenario that I see three stage scenario. Stage one, which is where I'm now, uh, is in total lockdown, no business activity of any kind until hospitals and other healthcare providers are ready to handle large numbers of patients. Uh, that's where we are right now, and it's absolutely the right place to be. Uh, we shouldn't be worried about, about business activity uh, until we know that, that our healthcare system can handle a uh, pandemic of this magnitude. Um, but sooner or later, the pressure to to, to, for the pendulum to swing back over to the business side is going to happen sooner or later, and I cannot tell you how long this is going to be. Uh, the pressure on government to start opening up the economy and return at least somewhat is going to be overwhelming, and the politicians will start doing this. We will see stage two, which is a limited resumption of business activity with a continued ban on the, on the biggest problems like large gatherings, you know, concerts, theaters, restaurants over a certain number of patrons, and the continued use of precautions, the six feet of separation, wearing masks, hand washing, all the stuff that you are currently doing. Um, stage three, of course, is the end of the pandemic, full resumption of business activities. Once experts are satisfied, the epidemic is under control and has worked sufficiently uh, its way through the U.S. mission and is on the decline. Stages one and two may repeat until the virus passes through the US population. I think the most likely scenario is we will see limited business activity followed by a resumed lockdown when the healthcare system is threatened with being overwhelmed. It's gonna go, that pendulum is gonna swing back and forth for a while until we're finally out, out of this, out of this, 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 this horrible mess. Uh, the impact is where is, it will vary, no secret, this has already happened. Uh, most likely to be effective negatively are businesses, small businesses that depend for their livelihood on people assembling in one place. So think restaurants, bars, gyms, theaters, um, people traveling on airplanes, airport concessions, limousine services, uh, people going on vacation, uh, travel agents, tanning salons, and body waxing. One of the first calls I had after the, uh, the, the, the shutdown in Connecticut was from a body waxing uh, a, a salon that was a client of mine. You know, anything your body uh, is going to be affected by that. But especially, you know, when do people have their body waxed? Well, when they're going on vacation to a beach somewhere and they want to wear a bathing suit. Large-scale events, small businesses that are dependent upon large-scale events, you know, vendors, concessionaires, at sporting events, concerts, and anything that involves the physical touching of other people, spas, hairstylists, you know, whatever. Uh, one, of, one of the more touching comments I have heard is that in another couple of weeks, we are all going to know everyone's true hair color uh, in the next two to three weeks if present trends continue. Uh, least likely to be affected, and we have to talk about this, uh, as Shakespeare once said, "'Tis an ill wind that blows nobody any good." Uh, there are people who actually are benefiting, and some are benefiting. Uh, from uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, liquor stores, uh, liquor sales stand are up 55% in the last three weeks since the shutdowns began. Uh, and online sales are up 250% nationwide. Uh, that's a lot of booze. And, and in the words of one of my favorite comments in the Wall Street, com Wall Street uh, Journal, no politician is going to be stupid enough to shut down, shut down alcohol in the of a pandemic. Um, and I think that's actually a very true comment. Uh, UPS stores, uh, any other service that relates to delivery. Uh, my local UPS store is doing great guns. There's very frequently a line outside that's going down the block with people still you know, doing their returns on Amazon and Zappos and those kind of places. Online retailers um, you know, are, are, are thriving. Amazon is trying to add 100,000 new workers nationwide uh, to cope with the, the expanded the demand for their services. Uh, lawyers, I, I have to say this with a smiley face, um, my business has been extremely busy. I last two weeks in March basically renegotiated leases from my clients for, for my clients to pay their April 1 rent payments. Uh, another thing that's not on the slide, but I think we have to talk about is, is firearms. Um, I understand that uh, registrations and background checks for firearms nationwide have gone up significantly in the last 
weeks. And that is based on fear of that 12 to 15 percent unemployment rate that I talked about a little bit earlier uh, in the presentation. Uh, let's face it, when people are starving, they are not too concerned about respecting other people's uh, rights to life, liberty, and property. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a bunch of survivalists probably who account for this as well. Um, you know, but a lot of it is just a well-placed fear, I think, of a rising crime rate uh, that will be a reality if the unemployment rate, you know, zooms to those levels. Last but not least, fast, fast food outlets would drive in customer services. If you're doing any kind of a restaurant these days, you are dependent upon your drive-through and your delivery. Your priority survive this horrible mess. Well, you have three basic priorities at this point. Maximize revenue. Do everything you can to get as much cash into your company now as you possibly can. Second is to minimize costs. Um, Okay, minimize your costs, get your costs as low, get your revenue as high as it possibly can go, get your costs as it can possibly go, and forget temporarily about profit, operating margin, and cash flow, and all the other stuff that we talk about in our normal uh, SCORE webinars during good times. Okay, your goal is to stay alive until Independence Day, July 4th, 2020. Uh, that should be your goal. Stay during the months of April, May, and June. Uh, why? Because it's almost certain that stage one will almost certainly be over by then. The pressure on government to try to get the economy back on back running again will be overwhelming. Point. If we're still, uh, if we're still, you know, staying home in, in in late June, the pressure to start doing some to go to stage two and get to some at least limited. Uh, limited business activity again will be overwhelming. We may not be out of danger by then. Remember, stage one and stage two may well, uh, we may be ping-ponging between those two for a while uh, until we can get the, 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 the epidemic under control, but are probable. Uh, by the time we get to July, number one, the risk of infection will be lower, both because of people self-quarantining and also predictions that the virus will be less transmittable during the warm summer months. Normally, viruses are killed or reduced by warm weather. Um, this will encourage more people to get out of doors and also and patronize local businesses. Secondly, have fun testing by that. And we will know a lot more than we do today about how the disease runs its course. Right now, the, 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 the reason why people are so afraid about it is that we simply don't know a lot about this virus. Again, the, everybody from the highest levels of government on down were caught with their pants down on this. We don't really have a lot of the information we need. By July, we should have the information we need to be able to predict the infection rate, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the 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 how long you know somebody who doesn't exhibit symptoms can go without uh, contacting other people. We'll have a lot more information than we have today, which will make things a bit more predictable. Um, cash flow is king. Do everything you can short of committing a felony to maintain revenue during stage one. Now, that sounds weird coming from a lawyer, okay? But these are not normal times. You may have to do some things that bend the rules a little bit in order to stay alive until July. I mean, if it's a choice between perfect compliance with your license, with your regulations, and staying alive until July, I think you need to lean at this point on staying alive until July, whatever that takes. Uh, so for these are just some examples. Um, restaurants, if you own a restaurant or bar. The key to your survival is going to be home delivery and curbside pickup. Um, offer your repeat customers free delivery, uh, volume con discounts, and, and sell what you have. If you have a restaurant or bar, you probably have a couple of hundred rolls of toilet paper you know, for your patrons that you're not using right now because people are not eating at your establishment. Why not make that a marketing advantage? Offer a free roll of toilet paper for orders of over 50 bucks. You know, I mean, it's cute. It'll get a lot of publicity, but it's also a very good th th thing to do for people who haven't stocked up the way they should. Um, you know, no one will fit. Another example, too, um, I understand that some of my local bars and restaurants are offering selling their, their, their half-empty bottles of liquor at uh, an extreme discount. Uh, so if you have a bottle of Pappy Van, Wink, Pappy Van Winkle bourbon that's half full, okay, you shouldn't be charging $600 for it, but you might be able to get maybe one or $200 for that. 
um, you know, and, and again, that may not be completely consistent with what you're supposed to do under your liquor license, but again, the goal is to survive until July and you sell the assets you have, not the ones you wish you had. Um, if you are running a travel or event business, okay, um, in lieu of refunds, try to keep refunds to a minimum. The airlines are actually doing um, a beautiful job of this right now. They're not, they're, they're trying very hard not to give uh, flyers their money back. What they're doing is they're offering their customers credit for the same or a similar trip within the next year at no additional cost. I have a client that runs a, a sports, a sporting events business. I can't be more specific than that, uh, but he has had a lot of success with that. What he is saying, all his trips have been canceled for the next few months. But what he's doing is he's saying, look, what we're doing is we're giving you a credit for the exact same trip. And if there's an increase in price between this year and 2021, we will eat that. You will not pay uh, anything. And a lot of his customers are supporting him with that, uh, with that approach. Um, if you are a professional speaker, if you are in an information business, it's time to embrace webinars. It's no secret that Zoom has become probably the, well, the, the, the fastest growing company in America in terms of revenue and profits in the last, in the last two to three weeks. And of course, they're giving away uh, a lot of what they're doing. Normally, they charge uh, for Zoom meetings that have more than two or three people uh, involved, and they're not doing that now. Uh, obviously, they're, they're, they're cooperating, they're trying to help people during this difficult time, uh, but time to embrace webinars. Uh, this is how you probably will be growing your information business going forward. Uh, it's not going to be through live meetings in a hotel room somewhere in Lower Slobovia. It's going to be doing the exact same thing that we are doing right now. Uh, if you own a luxury service or a spa, uh, push gift cards. Uh, right now, nobody is legally can use your services. So give, push gift cards for the future. Focus on birthdays, anniversaries, special events. Um, in Connecticut, uh, by law, uh, gift cards cannot have an expiration date. Uh, some other states may have restrictions on gift cards, ignore them, give gift cards, uh, sell gift cards that have an unlimited, uh, unlimited uh, time frame uh, where people can exercise them. Um, clothing and boutique retail, uh, push your online sales. People are still buying stuff. I can, I can, I can say that from personal experience. Uh, all the people at my local UPS store that are returning things to Amazon and Zappos, people are still buying things on Amazon and eBay. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for toilet paper, uh, the current, the current price on eBay is about seven fifty or to eight dollars a roll, uh, depending on the vendor and where they're located. People are still buying things online, take advantage of that. Your future, if you're doing retail, and especially if you're doing boutique retail, your future is online. If you do not already have an Amazon seller's account, an eBay seller's account, shame on you. Uh, this is going to be your future and, and no, more, no more important than it is today. So revenue in the door, however you can, do everything short of selling, of, of, of committing a felony. Look at all the stuff that's in your storefront right now that's not moving and make that, make that into a, a, a source of revenue. Do whatever you can do. Do not, you know, do not egregiously violate the law, but you may have to spend the rules just a little bit until we are in a position where we know what the future looks like and we can resume normal operations. Um, now let's talk about the second thing you have to do, which is to get your costs as, as low as they can possibly go. And here you have to be utterly ruthless. I'm gonna talk about ruthlessness in a few minutes later in this program. Um, perform triage on all your bills. Now triage is a French term. Uh, it, uh, it means to divide into three. Uh, it actually came out of World War I, uh, believe it or not, uh, during the First World War when there was a major battle and all the wounded were sent behind the lines to the, uh, to the medical unit. Those of you who were fans of the 1970s TV show MASH, you remember what that was all about too. The helicopters would fly all the wounded in. And basically the doctors looked at all these people and they divided them into three piles uh, or to three groups. Group number one were people who were going to be operated on and needed to be operated on immediately in order to save their lives. Uh, group number two were the people 
who were whose injuries were relatively minor and who could afford to wait to be operated on. And then group number three, three were the people who were just too far gone, uh, the soldiers who were too far gone, they were dying anyway. And the goal there was just to keep them as, as pain-free as possible until they naturally drifted off. Uh, hopefully this is not what is happening at hospitals around the country right now, but it was definitely happening uh, during World War I, and that's where the term triage came. You have to perform triage on all your bills. Um, I have a program on YouTube, those of you who know me, uh, I have a YouTube channel with over 40 one-hour videos on all aspects of running a small business. I have one which is particularly relevant right now. It's really written from the, it's done from the creditor side. It's called Dealing with Deadbeats. Uh, for the next few minutes, I wanna talk about the debtor side. You know, what happens when you owe a lot of money and you simply cannot afford to to pay everyone what they're due each month. Uh, doing triage is what you have to do to survive. Um, you need, to, you, it, it, you probably will be in a position for the next three months where you can pay some of your bills, you simply cannot pay all of them. How do you prioritize? The answer is you do triage. You divide into three piles. The first pile are essential products and services, things you absolutely have to have in order to stay in business until July 4th. Um, you know, essential businesses. So, um, you know, clearly, um, you know, your rent, although you're going to try, you're, although you are going to try to renegotiate that with your, with your landlord, um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but essential products. So if you are a, an online re retailer and you depend on one product for 95% of your sales, that supplier becomes critical, mission critical. That person has to get paid on time. You cannot afford an interruption in your source of supply. Uh, that person has a lot of leverage over you and you have to deal with them, whatever it takes. The second pile, and this is kind of an obnoxious thing to talk about, but it's a fact of life. Um, in my experience, when my clients owe people a lot of money, uh, if someone is not an essential service or product, but they make just a bloody new themselves. They just make my client's life miserable. Sooner or later, they get paid, especially if the debt is a small one. You know, sooner or later, I mean, it, it, sooner or later, those pe people who make a nuisance of themselves, sooner or later get paid. The third pile is everybody else, and everybody else waits you know, at least a month, maybe two, uh, until you can get back on your feet again. Okay, that's pile number three. So the lesson of this is that if you um, are a creditor, if somebody owes you money during these difficult times and you do not provide an essential product or service, your, your, whatever it is you do is not essential to their continued operations, then the only way to get paid is to make a bloody nuisance of yourself. Call them every hour, yell, scream, drop the F-bomb. Uh, there is a federal statute that says, you know, things you cannot do to collect at your debts. Uh, do not violate that statute but you know, go all the way up to what you are allowed to do under that federal uh, statute um, that, uh, that says the, uh, that, 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 li that re regulates how people can collect debts. Do everything possible because otherwise you are in the third pile and you are gonna have to wait. So if you're on the other side of the equation, identify your essential products or services, deal with those people, and then everyone else waits. If someone is owed a small amount of money, but they're making your life miserable, just write the check, stick it in the mail, get them out of your life. That's, the, that's how you're gonna be dealing with your, your costs for the next two to three months. Um, let's talk about renegotiating all of those essential products and services. Look for force majeure clauses in all your contracts. Um, this is a medieval term. It, it actually means it translates into an act of God clause. Most contracts, although interestingly enough, not leases traditionally, but most contracts do have a clause that says that either party was excused from doing what they have to do under the contract in the event of an act of God, a labor strike, um, a fire, flood, contagion. Hopefully the force majeure clause in all your contracts makes a reference to infectious disease or contagion. You can bet that every lawyer in the United States right now is updating their force majeure language uh, to comply with the, uh, the with, to, to make it relevant in an age of pandemic. Even if it doesn't specifically say that uh, contagion is covered as a force majeure event, enforce it anyway. I don't know a single judge anywhere in the United States that will say that this pandemic is not a force majeure event. Uh, I just can't believe any judge in the United States would say that. So, so if there is a force majeure clause in your contracts, enforce it. 
Um, when negotiating with landlords and franchisors, uh, some states, including New York, have put a moratorium on uh, evictions. I do not know offhand if Connecticut has done that. Uh, the last time I looked, they haven't. I do not know about New Jersey. Uh, find out if your state has put a moratorium on evictions so your landlords can boot you out of your space while you're dealing with this horrible thing. Um, but even if, but even if they have. Whenever you're negotiating with landlords and franchisors and people, if you are a franchisee, now is not the time to be paying a minimum monthly royalty of a thousand dollars a month. Get your franchisor to waive that. A good, a decent franchisor who cares about having a business when all this is over will definitely cut you some leeway here, as will most landlords. Don't talk about forgiveness, however. Talk instead about reductions temporary reductions and deferrals. Um, reduction means you're paying 50% of your normal rent, your normal fee, whatever it is you have to pay each month. Uh, a deferral means you're not gonna pay anything for 60 to 90 days, but it's gonna get tacked on at the end of your lease term, your loan term, whatever it is you're trying to, to renegotiate. Uh, lenders especially, and landlords especially, uh, they have obligations to, they, to their mortgagees, and as much as they would like to give you 90 days rent free, they simply are not in a position to do that. If they do that, they have to get it back out the back end or spread it out over the next year to two of rent payments. Um, be flexible when dealing with landlords, especially. As hard as it is to sympathize with landlords, they are in every bit as difficult a position as you are right now because they have their mortgage banks to, to consider. When negotiating with suppliers, don't just talk about reduced price. Talk about, uh, use other, try to get other concessions as well. Faster delivery times, uh, more flexible payment terms, uh, maybe, you know, reduced quantities. Maybe you want to increase your, your quantities, but spread the payments out over three or four months. Don't just talk about a price reduction with suppliers. Remember, they're caught up in the same boat that you are. So try to see or talk about non-cash uh, items that you can negotiate with them. They'll be a lot more flexible on that than they will about, you know, cutting their price and selling a cost. Unless, of course, they're providing things like masks or whatever. A lot of companies right now are selling those at cost or giving them away in our healthcare system get up to speed. I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about ordinary types of businesses, retail businesses. When dealing with employees, okay, reductions are preferable to outright firings. Um, in a minute, we're gonna talk about some of the government assistance programs that are available. And these programs are designed more than anything else to protect jobs and to keep jobs from disappearing. Um, Try to consider furloughs as opposed to outright firings. Sooner or later, we will be at stage two, at stage three, and you will have to hire them back once things improve. Um, so the nice, so the, the easier you can make their lives right now, the more, the, the, the happier they will be and the more loyal they will be when things, when things have changed and when things are better. Um, also, too, when when you furl, when you reduce, when you put an employee on half uh, half wages, that is not technically a firing that entitles them to unemployment compensation. If you fire an employee uh, and lay them off, they are entitled to unemployment compensation, which you will have to pay. Uh, and let's talk about your independent contractors right now. You know, a lot of you are saying, well, that's, that's a good thing, you know, but I don't have any employees, Cliff. I got all independent contractors. I 1099 them and my contract terms are that I can terminate my contract on 10 days notice, which is what I'm going to do. Well, think twice about that because if you are operating that way and a lot of small businesses operate that way, you know who you are. Um, there is a very strong risk here that if you fire these people, they are still going to terminate their contracts. They are still going to go to the unemployment office anyway and seek benefits on the grounds that they really weren't an independent contractor. They were really an employee. If someone is working 50 hours a week for your small business and you are 1099ing them, that is not the right thing to do. That person is an employee. The unemployment office is going to view that as an employment relationship and they're going to want to know why it is that you, your business never registered for unemployment payments the last 10 years that it's been in business. Uh, your independent contractors are not the snap on snap off people you sometimes think they are. Give serious thought, talk to an attorney, make sure that your independent contractors truly are independent contractors before you fire them and terminate their contracts. Look for emergency funds anywhere you can. Do you have business interruption insurance? If you have 
uh, a, a commercial liability policy, you're an umbrella liability policy, chances are you have as part of that something called business interruption insurance. Talk to your insurance broker right now. A business interruption insurance provides temporary coverage for things like rent payment, fixed cost. Uh, they don't co usually cover variable costs, but it covers usually things like rent, franchise payments, that kind of stuff. See if you have that coverage. And if you do, file a claim as soon as possible. This is why you have that coverage. If you do not have this coverage, shame on you. One of your priority, your immediate priorities should be as soon as this is all over, get a policy of business interruption insurance in case something like this happens again. Credit, now is the time to hit up your credit cards, your home equity line of credit if you have one, and other personal loans. Again, your goal is to stay alive until July. If all you need is ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to bridge that gap, you probably have enough equity in your in your home or credit cards that you can exploit on short notice. Uh, you can make short-term loans from your SEP IRA or 401k. Talk to your financial advisor or broker about this. Uh, you can make hardship withdrawals without incurring uh, interest and penalties. And boy, if this isn't a hardship, I don't know what is. Um, you can also too, although this is very risk risky, you can also take out money as long as you repay it within 60 days or roll it over into another um, uh, um, uh, employee benefit plan, you can get away with that. Just keep in mind that those 60 days go real fast. And if you do not either repay it or roll it over within the 60 days, then that withdrawal will be deemed a premature distribution. You will likely, you are likely to have uh, interest and penalties on that. Friends and family loans, if you have a rich Uncle Louis that owns a five liquor stores and is surviving uh, the pandemic uh, beautifully, now is the time to hit Uncle Louis up for money. Uh, just be sure that when you borrow money, especially from friends and family, that you don't treat them as friends and family. Get the same documentation with them that you would if borrowing money from a total stranger like yours truly. Now let's talk about government assistance. Um, these next five slides, I apologize, these are very uh, complicated slides, um, and I've been updating them virtually every day in the last couple of weeks. There's no way that we're going to get through this in the time available, so I'm going to do something very special. I normally do not share my slides uh, with attendees at score at my score webinars. Uh, the reason is people have do have a habit of stealing them sometimes, uh, but because these slides are so important, if at the end of this program, you send me an email. Do not send it to SCORE. Send it to me directly. I'll put my email address up at the very end of the program. I will send you a PowerPoint deck with just these five slides so that you have the information rather than you sitting there and trying to write all this thing down and getting writer's cramp. Uh, I'd much rather send you these five slides. It's very important information. SCORE will be doing some other programs uh, later next couple of weeks that will be going into some of this in greater detail. You definitely want to listen to those. Right now, I just want to make some basic points. Uh, Congress passed the CARE Act uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the key feature of that is the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. These are loans that are being made through the SBA uh, to cover payroll costs specifically. Again, the purpose of these programs is to keep people employed and to keep that unemployment number down as low as, they can, as it can possibly go. A 12 to 15 percent unemployment rate is simply unsustainable. At that point, we are in a Great Depression and the government is fighting like hell and treading water like hell to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, these are loans to small business. Uh, they are somewhat, the loan is forgivable under certain circumstances, uh, and the forgiveness will not be taxable income. <clears throat> and the SBA also, in addition to the PPP program, which is what everybody, the other thing I want to say about the PPP program, if you are listening to this program on archive, chances are by the time you listen to this, most of that money will have been, will have been uh, taken care of. Um, it, it will have been fully allocated, uh, probably. This money is going to go extremely fast. The SBA has other programs that are available, though. Uh, they can now do disaster loans of up to $2 million. They can also do express bridge loans of up to 25000 but only if you have already 
have a relationship with an SBA express lender. Talk to your bank and find out if they are an SBA express lender. Keep in mind these are Section 7A loans. You have to go through a bank. You don't apply directly to the government for these. You still have to go to a bank. You have to comply with all the requirements for Section 7A loans, the mountain of paper that you have to do. Uh, but it may be, well, it may be, um, it may be worthwhile doing it, especially since uh, these loans, these special loans under the CARES Act uh, can be deferred, uh, payment can be deferred for up to six to 12 months and that's worth doing. Get to know your local score office. I give this advice in every one of my presentations, not just my score presentations, but now is the time to really cozy up to your score office, get help. Uh, the rules for applying for these loans are fairly complicated. We lawyers are still trying to wrap our brain around some of the, uh, uh, some of the questions we're getting from our clients about the PPP program in particular. The score people know what, uh, how to do this, take advantage of that. Uh, help get, let your score counselor help you get that application in as soon as possible, especially if you're applying for a PPP loan. Uh, here is what new states, the states are also doing things to help small businesses is in distress. New York State is kind of lagging behind right now. Uh, there is a bill pending in the New York State Legislature, but as of, as of today, they have it has not been passed. Uh, I've given you the link here so you can sort of keep track of it to see uh, see what's happening. Um, New York City, interestingly enough, has one of the more generous programs uh, for businesses that are located within the five boroughs. Uh, small businesses with fewer than five employees. Uh, can, can get a grant to cover 40% of their payroll costs for two months to help retain employees if they can show impact. This is a very generous program. I've given you the link right here where you can find it. What Connecticut and New Jersey are doing, Connecticut has a program of small business uh, emergency relief loans. Connecticut has a, uh, New Jersey actually has a wide variety of programs uh, that some are loan based, some are grant based. Again, um, at the expense, at the, at the end of this program, um, if you send me a, um, a, um, an email, I will send you a, um, uh, a short presentation with just these slides so that you have all the information about the government assistance that is available. And I encourage you to also look at the other SCORE programs that will be offered on this topic. Here's one expense though that you should not cut. And it's counterintuitive, but now is not the time to cut back on your marketing, advertising, and promotion. In fact, I would recommend that you double down and spend more on that now, if you can, of course. If you can, of course you can. But take advantage of this. Now is the time to leapfrog your competition and show your customers that you are going to be one of the survivors in this, in this, in this economic and, and, and healthcare holocaust. Daily email blast, send daily email blasts and social media posts to your customers with information about reduced hours, curbside pickup, other things you're doing, the free roll of toilet paper for orders over 50 bucks, spended time offers and online events. A lot of local liquor stores are hosting online quarantini parties and wine tastings via Zoom meeting for their customers. Where you pick up a bottle of wine, you know, three bottles of wine, and then an expert comes in and has like a Zoom webinar where you talk, you taste the different wines and he talks about the differences between them. Do whatever you can to keep your customers with you. How people can use your products and services in creative ways. You know, do you have products that can be used to make masks and stuff like that? That. If you do, now's a good time to let people know what they can do. Hey, you can make a mask out of, you know, uh, out of this, uh, out of this, uh, this used t-shirt, this old polo shirt. Uh, you know, here's how you can do that. You know, that's a, a lot of artsy craftsy type businesses are doing things like this. News also about what you and your employees are doing to help people um, in need. One of my local liquor stores uh, here in Southern Connecticut actually did something brilliant about a week ago. What they are doing is they are donating 10% of all their profits to the Chinese takeout restaurant that's next door to them. Now, if you know anything about Chinese, about Chinese takeout restaurants, they need high volume because the cost of their entrees is so low, they need to average 75 to 100 orders a day to survive. And they are not getting that right now. So what the liquor store did, the owner is friendly with the owner of the takeout place. So that liquor store is donating 10% of um, their profits to the takeout restaurant, uh, which is a great, a great thing to do. And they are getting tons of favorable publicity because they're doing that. What if your, your business is booming? What if you do have a liquor store or a gun shop or you're a lawyer like me? Don't gloat or become complacent. 
you may very well be next. Dedicate a portion of your profits. Do what that local liquor store is doing. Dedicate a portion of your profits to help neighboring businesses who may be in need and let the world know you are doing that. Uh, just keep in mind that you cannot take a charitable deduction unless the recipient is a 501c3 organization. You will not be able to, to claim this on your taxes. Frankly, that is one thing I wish the CARES Act had addressed. They did offer a number of uh, tax benefits for um, their uh, tax benefits for small businesses, but this was not one of them. Uh, Nancy, if you are listening to this program, uh, in the next act, in the next bailout act, could you please add a clause saying that a business that donates a portion of its profits to a neighboring for-profit business can take a charitable deduction for a temporary amount of time. That will encourage a lot of booming businesses to uh, to take advantage of that and to help their uh, their less strong brethren, their weaker brethren. Offer discounts on your services or offer them free to particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Um, people right now are starved for good news stories of neighbors helping neighbors. Be a part of that. Uh, let people know that you care and they will reward you handsomely. I am not charging my clients right now for helping them renegotiate their leases or their franchise agreements. I am charging for normal business for things that I would have done anyway if the pandemic, but if, it, if one of my clients has an issue with a, a pandemic specific issue, I as a lawyer am not charging for that, uh, for helping them. And I know a lot of other lawyers are doing the same things with their clients. Okay, sooner or later, this will come to an end. Uh, now is the time to prepare for recovery. The first thing that all of you need to do, uh, this is one of the oldest stories that we have. It was written by a Greek guy named Aesop around 500 BC. It's called The Grasshopper and the Ant. You all know the story. It's about how the ants work their way through uh, the, the summertime. The grasshoppers, all they did was play and sing. And so when the winter months hit, the ants were prepared to survive the winter months, whereas the grasshoppers were dropping dead left and right. Um, Reread this story and make up your mind next time you are going to be an ant, not a grasshopper. When things get better, I mean, if you are suffering right now, you are suffering largely because you didn't prepare adequately for a black swan event like this. Make a commitment that, that you will not find yourself in this situation ever again. When things get better, make it your priority to establish a cash reserve equal to six months basic operating expenses. Before you start spending money on, on travel and fun stuff and discretionary spending, make sure you have at least six months basic operating expenses in the bank. This should be an interest bearing account immediately accessible uh, in case we have another pandemic. Uh, or a war or something like that. Speak to your bank about a $50,000 line of credit or a home equity line of credit, a HELOC. Uh, get, get some credit behind you that will help you get through six months, a six month uh, interruption of business. Apply for three credit cards you never intend to use. Sign up for business interruption insurance and diversify your suppliers so you're not as dependent on a single source. So if a pandemic hits Asia, you can still function. You're not relying you're not relying on China or, or Asia as the sole source of your supply. Um, I, I have a video that has, has been up on my YouTube channel now for several years. Uh, I encourage all of you to listen to it. Uh, it's one of my more controversial ones. I often get feed, uh, you know, I often get pushback from some people who, um, who, uh, who watch this one. Um, it's called Three Personality Traits Every Successful Entrepreneur Must Develop. If you go to youtube.com and search for Cliff Enico, you'll see it's one of the five top ones. Uh, and what I talk about in there, I talk about the need to be ruthless in business. And that's kind of an ugly word. Uh, it's a word that carries a lot of negative connotations for a lot of people. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look on Wikipedia, look at your dictionary, look up the word ruthless. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean unethical or sleazy or, or anything like or rapacious or anything like that. It's simply another way of saying heedless or reckless. In tough economic times, whatever the cause, it's the business owners who are not afraid to be utterly ruthless, who are willing to do outrageous, crazy, creative, in-your-face things, everything short of breaking the law to protect their businesses and keep them alive. These are the people who are most likely to survive and come back stronger than ever. By, by doing things that are totally outside of your comfort zone, doing things you never thought in a million years you would do, you may find uh, 
uh, the next breakthrough in your business. Uh, it, it's, it always amazes me that uh, that innovate, innovative activity and entrepreneurial activity peaks during economic recessions and economic de uh, depressions. Uh, when, back in the 1980s, when I started giving these programs, half of the Fortune 500 corporations that were in existence in the 1980s were founded during the Great Depression. I find that an amazing, an amazing fact that during tough times, let's face it, necessity is the mother of invention. You can't do business the normal way. So find new ways to do things. And by doing that, you may discover the next killer app that will enable your business to survive when the pandemic is over. Don't be afraid to be utterly ruthless. It's not a bad thing. You can quote me on this. So here's my summary. Um, focus now on surviving stage one of the pandemic. Get to July 4th, whatever it takes. Uh, when you get there, you'll find that it'll probably be easier for you to survive because you'll, let's put it this way, right now we're all treading water, but by July 4th, you should be able to feel the bottom under your feet a little bit. Keep the revenue flowing, even if cash flow is negative. Throw out the accounting book for right now. You've got to get cash in the door because uh, cash is king during an economic downturn. Get your fixed costs as low as possible, but don't scrimp on your marketing and promotion. Don't lose your customers. Keep them with you. Uh, keep your fan base, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, update your Facebook page every hour if you have to. Let the world know that you are going to be one of the survivors here. Find emergency funds wherever you can. Apply for government assistance, but don't hold your breath. Right now, everybody and his or her brother, sister, grandfather father is applying for these loans right now. It's going to take a long time to get the cash. And quite frankly, you know, a lot of people I think are going to be disappointed with these, uh, the, especially the Section 7A loans, which have never been an easy thing to do. Uh, in, in my experience, Section 7A loans take 60 to 90 days uh, to, get, to get properly uh, documented and funded. I don't see that changing uh, during the current pandemic. Read Aesop's The Grasshopper and the Ant, resolve to be better prepared for the next global disaster. And remember, in the immortal words of songwriter Randy Newman, it's a jungle out there. Uh, the more ruthless you are, the more likely you are to survive. And that is my advice for survival. Um, the, the, I have a, a lot of other stories about businesses that have done creative things to overcome tough times. They're in my, my book, Small Business Survival Guide. It's kind of like an Aesop's fables for small business owners. And as promised, here is my email address. Uh, if you send me an email to this address, do not send it to SCORE, send it to me. I will send you free of charge. You're not signing up for anything. I'm not putting you on any list. Uh, I will send you a short version of this PowerPoint presentation with the five slides on government um, assistance with, that had all that technical information about how you apply. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, back to Elliot and let's answer some questions because I know we got a lot of them. Yes, thank you, Cliff. That was wonderful. And be before we start going over the questions, I just want to remind everyone, you can get a mentor by going to the Fairfield County dot score dot org website or when you do get there we do have a button for uh, assistance with the COVID-19 business assistance and uh, we have some experts that will help guide you through the process and get you the right websites so um, let's look at some of these questions that we have um, one question that came up at one point with someone, what about health insurance benefits for employees? Cliff? Yep, yep I'm just taking a look here. Um, yeah, okay, so health insurance here. Well, let's put it this way. You do what you can. Um, you know, if you are paying, most small businesses are below the uh, Obamacare mandate, which is still, in sort of a limbo right now. There's a big question about whether that's constitutional or not um, under the Affordable Care Act. But if you are you know, providing insurance for your employees, uh, obviously you are gonna get a, a massive number of claims. If indeed your employees do uh, have, do come down with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, really the best thing that you can do here is speak to your insurance broker, learn the details of your policy, what's covered, what's not. 
Um, I'm not an expert on health insurance, um, and but I do know that there's going to be, this is another area where, you know, uh, small businesses with employees are going to get clobbered uh, in a very, in a very big way. So do, I guess just you right now, you're locked into whatever your coverage is, find out what it is and see if there's a possibility uh, I mean, if you, hopefully none of, nobody on this call is in the situation of, of, of negotiating their next year's premiums now. If you're in the middle of negotiating those, the timing on this is just horrendously bad. Uh, and you should definitely ask your insurance company, you know, what are you, what are they going to do to prevent a spike in premiums next year that you simply cannot afford? Uh, and, and, you know, if the answer isn't satisfactory, maybe it's time to, uh, to find another, to not find another insurance provider. Again, I, I really don't know what to tell you on that. Uh, obviously, you know, a, a lot of, people, a lot of companies are firing employees for the, for, the, for the simple reason that they want to release themselves from the coverage obligations in case they get sick. And that's just not the right way to treat employees. Uh, doing that to someone will definitely, will, it's going to be very hard to get them to come back to you when times are good, if that's the way you're, you're treating them now. Now, having said that, a lot of small businesses simply don't have uh, that, uh, that, that leverage right now. I mean, I, these are not good times. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and you do what you have to do to survive and clean up the and clean up the messes later. That's what being ruthless is all about at the end of the day. Okay, another one was uh, something that's very timely with all the publicity is about Zoom and privacy. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the well, Zoom is wrestling with this on a daily basis. We all know about the phenomenon known as Zoom bombing, where you know somebody hacks into a meeting like this and they post like obscene photos and stuff like that, and they do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, they are working on this in a very big way. Obviously, I am not going to share you know personal confidential information on a webinar like this one. Um, you know, uh, if you really do have a, a, a question that might be sort of embarrassing or sensitive, the better approach would be to email me or better yet, email your score counselor, uh, where there's a greater expectation of privacy. Um, I mean, like anything with the internet and my, my colleague and good friend, Bud Freund, who did, uh, I know he did a very good program last week on computer security, uh, here for Fairfield County score. I would, might suggest that you, you maybe get that one, dig that one out of the archives and listen to some of his specific tips on what you can do to, uh, protect yourself. Uh, the Zoom people are getting better now to log into Zoom meetings. Now you have to do a password. They're trying to do two-step authentication. Um, so they are, they are trying to address the issue. But again, the magnitude of this just caught everyone by, by surprise. Here's a tip, by the way, for those of you doing Zoom meetings, uh, schedule them at, at, at unusual times. Don't schedule them for 11 a.m. or noon or 2 p.m. Schedule them for 12, 11 or 207 or something like that. Because what's happening with Zoom right now, the, the, so many people are signing on and using the Zoom platform at the exact same time that the, band, the bandwidth is becoming an issue. And there's issues with internet connections and all of that stuff. By scheduling your call at a, at a time when there's less likely to be a lot of traffic, uh, you'll probably have a, a smoother and more pleasant experience. Okay, here's another one. Um, what suggestions do you have if your bank, in this case, Wells Fargo, was refusing the PPP applications at this time? Yeah, some banks are going to be overwhelmed by this, quite frankly. I, I was not aware of the Wells Fargo situation, but I'm not surprised. As I say, by the time that most people look at, listen to this program on archive, chances are that, um, that the the money that it has that the government has made available will have been uh, fully committed. Um, there won't be any more loan money available. Um, the the point was um, the. Uh, the question is, I guess, is really should you go through a bank? Some of the loans, like the Section 7A loans, you have to go through a bank. You can't apply to the government directly. You have to get be approved by a bank first, and then the bank applies for a government guarantee up to 80, 90, 100 percent. 
uh, if it's a PPP loan, the forgiveness features will apply to that. What the government is doing is indemnifying the bank for your missed payments is really what's going on there. Um, so for those kind of loans, you have to. For some of the programs, you can apply directly to the SBA. That's why I'm very anxious to give people the details because each program is different. Each program has its own set of rules and you have to follow the rules for that specific program, whatever it is. This is not one size fits all. Uh, the Connecticut loan program, for example, I believe is already shut down. They had 4,000 applications on day one. Uh, there's just no more, more money available in uh, Connecticut. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for questions today. Cliff, again, thank you, that was great. And as a reminder to everyone, this recording of, the, of this webinar and the materials are being made available in a couple of days at the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Our next webinar will be at 12 noon on Tuesday, April 21st, and the topic is five ways to get going with Google with Nanelli Guzaran as the presenter. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's live webinar, and please fill out your evaluations, which will be sent to you via email. In closing again, thank you, Cliff. Great presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone. And please remember to uh, go to the SCORE website and click on request a mentor if you need help and look for the uh, COVID-19 business assistant button on our website. Everyone have a nice day.